Okay, so hopefully this is what we're all here for tonight. Andy, next slide, please. And over to Kevin for this one. Yeah, good evening, everybody. As Duncan said, thank you for joining us. This is a bit of a candidate preparation slide, really. Came about from one of the presentations we did. Just a bit of an overview before we actually get into the nitty gritty of the test itself. What about the role of the instructors? Again, we've got explanation, demonstration, evaluation of the flying and the knowledge, but that's got to include the practical side of questions as well. So that's where your instructors fit in. Mm -hmm. The role of the examiner, pre and post test explanation, evaluation, and there you'll find a mock test is really, really good for experience. Okay, so you can use your examiner to the full advantage. What about your candidate? Obviously, they need to be prepared, not just in the flying, but in the knowledge. They need to be aware of all the test requirements, all the standards, and that does include knowledge about flying, knowledge about legislation and safety. So there's quite a lot there for the, the candidate to do. Most importantly, practice, 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 and then practice again. And to that end, when the weather is bad, like it is here today, uh, or if you live in Leicester and you're locked down, then the simulator can be quite useful just to keep your skills going, keep your skills set up to the top level. Okay. Don't forget, help and guidance is available for many of the above, but also the Achievement Scheme Review Committee members, your area chief examiners, your instructors, your examiners, your club officials, and there's lots of publications, including videos, that you need to be aware of to back up what you're going to do within the flying part of this test. So without further ado, I'll hand back over to Duncan, uh, and thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Kev. Thanks for that. John Collister's got his hand up. Um, John? I have. Um, um, this is one for examiners out there. Do many candidates actually turn up not knowing things like the correct way to fly the eight or yes. you know, that sort of yes. thing? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Unfortunately, yes. 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 <laughs> yeah. So, sometimes through, to, through their own lack of preparation and lack of practice, just think they can just turn up and do it. Um, quite often it's a case that they're, um, they haven't got any examiners in the club, so they haven't had anybody, while they've practised a lot, <clears throat> um, they haven't had anybody to actually take them through, you know, what the examiners are looking for. So practice um, the wrong thing. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I've seen some absolutely immaculate uh, wrong B tests where they've clearly practised, but they've just not done the manoeuvres how they've asked to be done. Right. So... Right, over to you, Duncan. Okay, Andy, okay, next slide, please. Have we done that one? Yep. Yeah. The overview. Nope. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so just looking at uh, how you go about being tested for a B certificate, hopefully this is familiar to, you know, to most of you. So you need, um, if the examiners are club examiners, you need two of them, and the lead examiner must be in this case, because it's a fixed wing power B, the lead examiner must be a fixed wing um, examiner. Um, obviously, um, if it's a different discipline, the lead examiner must be qualified in that particular discipline. Um, it's not unusual for examiners to be qualified in more than one discipline, um, but it's, um, it's not compulsory. Uh, and if you, uh, if you, if the test is being conducted solely by a chief examiner, then um, that examiner has to be appropriately qualified, which in this case is, is fixed wing. Um, quite often I'm asked as a chief examiner to conduct a test on my own. Whenever there is another examiner available, irrespective of discipline, I would always ask the other examiner to, to be involved. My, my personal view is two heads are always better than one. So, so why not? And it's good practice for everybody. So looking at the model, um is it uh you know does it have to be ic or electric it can be either it doesn't matter um but if it's an electric model uh, as you will have seen on previous presentations 
it has to be considered live as soon as the main flight battery is being connected. In other words, the model has to be suitably restrained and treated as if it was an IC model with the engine running. Um, obviously, the model has to be suitable to fly all the maneuvers uh, required in the test. You can't use that my model won't do that as an excuse for uh, missing out elements of the test. And because it's a, a power fixed wing test, the model has to be over a kilo and has to mustn't feature any form of stabilization. Okay, next slide, please, Andy. Okay, height, speed, and positioning. You know, again, slide that's familiar for most of the tests. Test should be flown at a height of somewhere between 100 and 150 feet. Um, We've, particularly for the B test, we wouldn't expect the pilot to be blasting around the sky at full throttle all the time. Um, and that would not be a good indicator to the examiner. Um, and crossing maneuvers should be performed uh, at a consistent, appropriate and safe distance out from the pilot. I, one of the things I always say to, to my candidates, if you scare me during the test, you're unlikely to pass. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> So part A of the test is to carry out the pre-flight checks as required by the BMFA safety code. Um, there's basically, it's a five point check for um, a fixed wing uh, power, for the fixed wing power test. And basically we ask the candidate to assume that the, the flight for the test is the first flight of the day. In other words, they've just got the model out of the car and they're checking it all over and putting it together and checking all the various bits and pieces that, that are on the list here. Um, before they prepare to commit to the test and commit to aviation. Most important bit is don't forget a fail safe check. Um, it's, 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 some, it's not compulsory at the moment, but interestingly, it's something that in my experience, most examiners always check. I certainly do. I know Andy does. I bet my fellow colleagues on the ASRC do as well. Uh, question okay. from uh, Stuart Willis. Okay, Stuart. Good to see you tonight. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, quick question, what about a range test on the transmitter, on the um, transmitter receiver? Um, it's not compulsory, uh, not, not for each session. Um, and it's a bit of a hobby horse of mine, to be honest. On 2.4, it's almost not worth the paper it's written on. Um, but that's, that's perhaps a, a <laughs> subject for discussion for another day in the interest of me not spending half an hour on my soapbox. Uh, <laughs> But I think it's, I promise Stuart, if you don't mind, we could pick that up at the end usefully. But it's, um, it's not, a, if the candidate chose to do it, I wouldn't penalize them in any way, shape or form, but I wouldn't fail them if they chose not to. Because the, the wording in the handbook is um, periodic or something like that. It's, it's, it's reasonably vague. Does, does, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, fine, thanks. Thank okay, no probs. Um, but it's worth picking that up at the end. Okay, a pilot must stand in the designated pilot area for the entirety of the test. Uh, and the first maneuver is to take off and complete a left or right hand circuit and overfly the takeoff area. And the guidance says no more than that. Um, so the type of circuit to arrive at overflying the takeoff area um, is entirely at the candidate's discretion. So it doesn't have to be rectangular, it can be any of the ones that are described here. Um, you'd obviously like to think that it would be conducted in a reasonably um, controlled manner. Um, and, and it's very important to, to stress, I think we've said this before, that the examiner will always be looking for those elements of the flight that aren't the specific manoeuvres. So to me, a lot, a lot of the test is how well the candidates prepared in terms of preparing the model for each of the set manoeuvres. Uh, and as I said on the slide here, the model may be carried out to the takeoff point or it may be taxied. Important thing is, if you are using um, an assistant to help you with any of this, they mustn't do anything without being prompted by yourself. And that's the, the, the circumstance where that can be a problem is if it's not something you do normally. So although it says you can you may use an assistant if you don't normally use an assistant or a helper i wouldn't change what you normally do don't do something special for the test because that's where you like to do something daft if it's not your normal routine um, <clears throat> uh, just seen another question here 
does the type of circuit have to... Be... Oh, gone. That's, that's Charles. Charles, do you want to uh, unmute yourself? Yep, sorry, it was just, um, does, it, does the type of circuit the candidate's going to do have to be stated before you take off? So, in other words, if somebody was going to do a rectangular circuit, cocks it up and ends up doing a, a racetrack circuit, do we need to specify what we're going to do before we take off? No, no, no. no. The, the guidance is just you've got to arrive in a controlled manner back over the takeoff, so, takeoff so it, point. So it could start off as a rectangular circuit at one end and be a, a yep. half circle at the other end? Well, yes, absolutely. I mean, what I say to my candidates is, You've got to do lots of rectangular circuits in the test. Yes. So why not use that as a bit of a practice sure. for assessing, sense, the, yeah. assessing the wind conditions on the day or whatever? So yeah, yeah. decide in advance what you're going to do. You don't have to declare it to the examiner, but yeah. use it as a practice for what you're yeah. going to have to do later. So. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Okay, so we've got the, the, the classic figure of eight, which we, um, which we had to do in the A test. And uh, I think it's fair to say, and I hope my fellow examiners would agree with me. I look for a greater degree of precision with, on the figure of eight in the B test than I would do for the A test. In other words, I would allow greater latitude in the A than I might do for the B. Um, I'm, it might be a bit contentious to say it's a relatively simple maneuver, but because it's a, I think it's a relatively simple maneuver, I think it needs to be um, flown with a reasonable degree of precision at B certificate level. Um, very important to that you announce the your intentions for the eight before you do it, um, because part of the figure of eight is in conflict with the normal circuit direction. So again, a very important element for all of the tests is communication. And as we all probably have experienced, uh, quite often when a candidate goes out to do a test, everybody else stops flying to uh, to you know to give them their best shot at it. But actually, that doesn't always help, and, and, and it's not required. Um, and I actually think it's quite good if there are other activities going on, particularly for a B test, um, around the candidate, because also it, it, it has the advantage that it hopefully prompts them into all the good communication that they would do normally um, when they're flying with their, with their club mates or, or fellow flyers. Um, so, uh, but it's communication during the test is is very important uh, as i've already said i'd expect the maneuver to be flown um, to a higher degree of precision than than in the a crossover point must be pretty much in front of the pilot model must be flying away from the pilot at the point of the crossover point of crossover and i'm looking for both circles to be of approximately the same diameter and the height to be reasonably constant throughout yeah. uh, question from john right okay john far away you have to mute yourself. So if nobody else is flying, you still expect us to announce we're Absolutely. doing it? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, tell, I tell, if there's nobody else flying, I tell my candidates to assume that I'm another flyer. Right. Some clubs don't have the protocol where they do uh, announce they're going the other way. Right, okay. Well, they should we, have. We stress it in the guidance, <laughs> yeah. We stress it yeah. in the guidance. Uh, you know, communication on the flight line is an essential safety element. And if you're going um, the opposite way, that's very important. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's part of the pre-flight briefing. As For every brief test I've taken, I've always said to the candidate, you've got to assume that there are a few other people flying. So behave exactly as you would if other people are flying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, We've also got a question from Peter Farnell. You should be able to unmute yourself. Well, it, it was John really just uh, picked up half of my question as well, which was, you know, your local protocol that you may have been running under for 20 years and you come up to an exam and you, you know, you're trying to do something different. So, but you've answered it, Andy. Yeah. yeah. It, I don't see how that is actually a club protocol thing, though. That's a, a general no, safety thing when anybody's flying. If, if you're suddenly going to be in a reverse circuit to everybody else, um, just your own self-preservation of your model should have you telling people. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think it's a club protocol thing. No, pro protocol's the wrong word. Um, it, it's it, protocol... Me, it, it, means guidelines or whatever but you know 
it's what happens at the field, how it operates. Yes. Right. No, okay. So it's, it's customer it's more, practice. Well, customer, yeah. It's, that's the right word, John. Yes. Yeah. Customer yeah. practice. I, I was going to be a little bit contentious and say bad habits. But sorry. Yes. Uh, no, I, I, I think for that, yes, yeah, bad habits is exactly it. And some re-education is required. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's the same. I mean, you wouldn't dream of not shouting dead stick if you had a dead stick, would you? Yeah. Well, that, yeah, that's exactly what I wrote. Yeah, we have landing takeoff on the runway clear. But once you're in the air, it's such a small club that there's very few people flying at any one time. Right. Yeah, yeah. But it, the, the, the other thing I would say is that it, it is detailed in the guidance. So the guidance does say, you know. So if they've done a little bit of prep for the test, hopefully they'll have seen it, even if it's not their common practice yeah i mean really it's it's it's, it's what you might call best practice best practice thank you kevin that's a that's a good term yeah yeah we do have a question from paul lewis but i suspect it might be better after the short video of the of the figure of eight. Oh, okay Get that one yeah so cool we'll is the video on. next it is yep. indeed. okay here we go let's hope the let's hope we got the bandwidth yeah Okay, so now we're seeing it in plan view. Oh, a bit jerky. Right. Uh, so, uh, Paul, Paul Lewis, you asked a question. Does the yeah. uh, does the video help with your question there? Um, well, I think so because it doesn't mean that. But uh, I know some people uh, have interpreted that uh, flying straight away means that it has to actually you have to actually level the wings and fly straight away from yourself before turning the opposite way. Yeah, you're sort of flying away from yourself, but only very, very, very briefly, briefly instantaneously, yeah. almost. Yeah, you, yep. it's uh, so if you've timed it right, you, you're rolling from one one bank to the other, aren't you? So yeah. All right, and we've a question from Al Davidson. Can you mute yourself, Al? That's very difficult to answer because it, it's also critically dependent on the weather conditions on the day, I would suggest. It's, uh, I think, an experience is, is the, uh, the answer to that. Um, you, you're looking at a multitude of things. If, if the altitude is, is varying, um, you'd expect the crossover point to be bang on. And, you know, if, if the crossover point is slightly off, you want everything else to be uh, you know, to be uh, spot on. And it, it's a sort of combination of all the elements of the figure of eight uh, give you an overall, as an examiner, give you an overall impression of whether it's uh, suitable for passing. Uh, yeah. But a, a lot of it is experience. And I think Corn has uh, a question to ask. Yeah, sorry, uh, just on that, on that figure, because... This came actually. This came up in my um, when I did the A test. When I, 
if you look at the video, the aeroplane is actually flying away from you for a good two seconds there before it turns the other way. If you look at the picture, they don't they don't match. And I'm confused about this because and then the reason why I'm asking this is um I looked at the the picture carefully because the thing was in my when I did my A test, the examiner told me that you know, you, you're not you're not to go away and then straight over. I don't know how to explain this. So you go straight over, right? Um, you have to fly for a little bit. It's almost like it's not an eight. It's more like a I don't want to call it. It's two. It's, it's just almost a square, right? You you fly away, and if you look at the video exactly, that's how the video was flown as well. So I just wanted to make that clear because the thing is, is when you go and practice this, and then it changes on that day. It, it is quite distracting. You um, know. The diagram is exactly what you're aiming for. That's that's you know, okay. you, you, that point where the aircraft's directly away from you should be you, you, you short, should be moving over as short as possible. Yeah, I mean that's what you're aiming okay. for. But obviously, there's a, a certain amount of leeway from the examiner on that. Okay. Yeah, and I think I think it, this is where um, you know you may have the opportunity or I would certainly seek the opportunity to do a dummy test with the examiner before the real test. And also the examiner will, will communicate to you during the test. And also I think examiners will look for candidates to be, especially on a B, to be to a certain extent self-aware. So if the, you know, let's say imagine we're now in the test situation and the examiner didn't like it, he may get you to repeat the maneuver and he will almost certainly tell you which element he wasn't happy with and again if this wasn't in the exam situation if it was a dummy test i'm sure the examiner would would point out various things that he wasn't happy with at, at various points in the maneuver um so you know the, it's not a there is a communication between examiner and candidate during the test and it may be to repeat but also the advantage of having a a, uh, an informal dummy test before the formal test is enormous an advantage. So, and, uh, and actually, I'm not, if you watch the video, I mean, watching it now, it was very jerky, but if you watch it on YouTube, I think you'll get a better. I, I have watched it. That's why I wanted to ask yeah. the specific question because the yes. thing is, as well, is, is for me, it's like you guys said before we started, is to practice it correctly, right? Yep. Yep. I don't want to, I don't want to be thrown at the day and say, no, you're doing it wrong. But it's interesting. Now you have to do it this way, and then yeah. you know, it's, and then uh, you know, you're already stressed. Yeah. I, well, I, I think I, if you aim to produce, if you're looking down at it, what's in that diagram, you can't go too okay. far wrong. That's yeah. what that's what you're aiming for. And it, in, yeah. interestingly, you you think there's a, a problem with the video. A lot of the comments we've had about the video, because the one you've seen is the one for the A test, and a lot of the comments are that it's too good an example for the A test. But. Anyway, what I wanted to do... <laughs> we have was... a, we've a, a, a queue of questions. <laughs> we'll, 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 get, we'll go to... Um, so any of these questions not involving criticising Duncan's figure of eight? <laughs> <laughs> so we'll go oh, to John... People, we'll, people we'll normally to... say it's too good, Andy. Yeah, we'll go to John Beck first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, hi, uh, Andy. Um, just to let you know going forward, I, didn't, I know how the figure of eight works and what you do. But I didn't see the video or the diagram. It didn't come up on the screen. All right. Okay. <clears throat> right. Um, it's it's the the, uh, the video was an excerpt from the uh, video that's on YouTube, uh, and it's just the figure figure of eight part on that. So you can capture. Okay. Yeah. Okay. On, on the recording of this presentation, when it goes out, it should be in there because it did come up on my screen. Sure. All oh, right. Okay. okay. Right. I mean, the, okay. I, I'm going to I'm going to annotate this diagram here, but it's the one that those of you that um, would have attended the A certificate uh, presentation will have seen, because basically the and, and it's unusual to see the this level of error at at B certificate level. But the most common mistake with the A is is here. People will turn too early and too sharp, and then they can't make the intersection point. And the intersection point comes off somewhere down here, and this half ends up being. There's nothing there showing up on mine. Is that showing but up on anybody else's? No, nothing. Oh, there we nothing. go. It's appeared all of a sudden. Oh, there we go. No. <laughs> so it's nothing. this. It's this point here. If you can see my cursor, 
Can everybody see my cursor? Yeah. Yeah. It's, so, it's pe people initiate this term way too early. Uh, but again, this is, as, a, as I, I would stress, this is an unusual error at B certificate level. That's, uh, it but it's a, a common it mistake. Can, it could be a forced error due to the wind conditions as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, th I think what I, what I see, I don't know if this is going to show. Uh, yeah, I, I, can, I can see your cursor error. You Andy. can see my cursor, can you, on the blue yeah. line? Yeah. More often, well, there's two, there's two areas really. They will either go too far to the middle and then suddenly have to do a 90 degree turn yeah. rather than doing the quarter of a circle that is called for. Or at this point, the track that Duncan's <coughs> taken where they just do the first quarter of the next circle and they just pull it too tight. Uh, and and that those two are the main errors I see on the figure of eight. And if you pull that first quarter of the first full circle too tight, you're almost certainly not going to hit the crossover point. Yeah. Uh, and that that's where it seems to go very very wrong for. Uh, yeah, this is the people. this is the that's the problem area, isn't it? Yeah. So. All right. Okay. I'll tell uh, you that. Right, okay, moving on. Have, hang on. Oh, oh, oh sorry, I've got questions. I, th I think oh. Ian Nelson wants to. Uh, has got a question. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes, you can. Yeah, hang on. We're standing to attention, Ian. I'm sorry, you should be. Um, <laughs> what I've always briefed when I pre exam is that uh, when you're doing either A or B uh, to get you onto decent circles, is that as you fly away from yourself, you need to see the cross of the tail for about one to two seconds before you start to turn onto the second circuit. And that, to be honest with you, has always stood my candidates in good stead. Yeah. I always, I always tell people to relax and take time here, where I'm drawing now. Because uh, when you're into wind, just by this arrow, you're building yourself space and time. Because you need to build, your space and build yourself space and time into wind. Because as soon as you turn downwind, here, or, or really here, um, you start to pick up speed over the ground. And that is where it's, that makes, that's the hard point in terms of making your intersections. I'll yeah. clear all that scribble. There we go. Oh. I think the, the other thing when doing the figure of eight is use the space that you've got. Um, yeah. Fly, yeah. Don't uh, fly a big one and don't fly it too fast. And you've got plenty of time to correct as you're going around then. Yeah. yeah. One of the things I always tell all of my candidates for all the maneuvers is don't rush the test. Just take your time yeah. and, and don't be in a hurry to complete the manoeuvres. Yeah. Uh, John has a uh, point to make. I have had quite a lot of discussions with my, what's he called, the Aries Regional Controller, or is it Steve Mason? Achievement yeah. Scheme Coordinator, Area Coordinator. That's, yeah. that's it, right. Because I used to be uh, a regional moderator for maths exams, and, and as far as I'm, I was concerned, there's a right... And there's a wrong, and and he we had a lot of discussion about this. There isn't actually a set variation. There's not a distance in the middle that you can be out by. It's not <clears throat> ten feet either way or ten meters either way. You're actually using your judgment as an examiner about whether they're in control and doing it correctly, aren't you? There's no measure to it. You know, and the, but there's equally there's no rule rule in the sky. So you you know how exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. you come down to how could you judge ten meters at, at a distance yeah. and things like that. So no, it's not. Um, and the, it, it's important to people to remember that the achievement scheme is a voluntary scheme. It's not like competitions. We we don't have we don't have you know how errors in manoeuvres that you use to down mark the manoeuvre we don't have any of that it's it's that's not what it's about we we do our best to achieve um consistency in examiners by having by running examiner workshops and in fact there's going to be one of these presentations on running examiner workshops um but um yeah no we, we it's deliberately not too prescriptive like that i mean for a mass test john Mass is very easy, isn't it? It's really, it's either right or wrong. No, because you have to give marks for method to get it wrong. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but uh, the okay. point is, there aren't any measurable limits to it. Like the roll, when it's got to be centred, it hasn't got to be centred within 25 feet of, or 10 feet, because you can't judge that anyway. No. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, we've got a comment here from Martin Harris, if you'd like to uh, unmute yourself. Um, you there, Martin? 
Yeah, I was only just trying to reply to John um, in maths exams terms, but I think uh, um, the controller, I can't think of uh, Duncan, Duncan, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Duncan, yeah. Sorry. Uh, Duncan's already answered that. Okay, fair enough. And uh, Stuart Willis has got his hand up. Uh, thank you, Derek. Just a question. Um, flying sites, I mean, are some flying sites easier than others? I mean, I fly two sites, so one of them's got trees on four sides. And at one end, they're like 150 feet tree that you have to fly over, and they're about, you know, about 70 feet at the other, the other end. So is there any consideration from an examiner to the actual site that you're flying? Whereas I also fly at the, uh, a, a, another field that's a big open field, and you could do the eight figure of eight at two foot, and you, you still wouldn't hit any trees. I'm just wondering, you know, is, is there any guidance on the, on the flying site as far as, I mean, I couldn't actually do at, um, you know, up to 100 feet, I couldn't do a figure of eight inside of our field because of the trees at either end sort of thing so i was just just wondering what the well, wherever are there's a potential issue with the site in terms of the space available it's something you should be discussing with the examiner <coughs> during the pre-flight briefing uh, right. and, and then uh, if the examiner thinks you know perhaps you need to do the figure of eight higher so you, you, your trees aren't an issue it, it is something to discuss before you start the flight Wherever there's anything that's out of the ordinary, it should be discussed beforehand. And, and it's a, a crucial part of the actual test is the pre-flight briefing. Um, when I'm examining, I, I talk through each manoeuvre and make sure that the candidate is aware of what I'm looking for. Um, and if there is anything slightly out of ordinary with the site, I'm hoping the candidate is going to raise it. Um, or if I, if I have any questions about it, I, I will raise it with the candidate. Right. Yep. Okay. Yep. Oh. Go on, John. Another one from John Beck. Oh hi. Yeah. When I um, I must have, I find that people when they come to take the um the, their A test, they when they come to do the figure of eight, um, I tend to find that people, I think it's only na natural that people want to take the test before they're actually ready. Um, when I took my A test with Mark Barnes. The, the real flying club I'd never flown there before and then I, f I realised that um, I had to fly around a tree uh, between two trees and over a hedge uh, for coming in for me dead stick landing um, but because because I was well ready for my A test I found then that I quite, quite actually I actually quite enjoyed it enjoyed the challenge of a new field a different field but I think like with, with the B test when when you're actually doing the figure of eight, because if if you're ready for the for the, the figure of eight, you, you're not going to have a problem with your circles if it's a high if you've got high winds and you, you're sort of upwind is smaller than your downwind. Um, it, it's it's all a matter. Of, uh, and and I remember Nathan Farrell Jones saying to me, "Practice, practice until you're sick of doing your figures of eight, uh, and, and then you're not going to." Yeah. Okay. All right. Moving right. on then. In the interest of moving on. Yep. There we go. All right. Inside loop. Fly into wind and complete one inside loop. Uh, Maneuver should be performed in front of the pilot. Um, quite clearly says in the guidance a perfect loop is not required, but we are looking for an exit height and nine that are close to those at the point of entry. Um, the examiner will be looking to make sure the candidate doesn't skew out of the loop and also watching for appropriate use of the throttle. Okay, next manoeuvre is the outside loop, which is which starts downwind. So we fly downwind and complete one outside loop. Um, the candidate is expected to climb to an appropriate height beforehand. Once again, like the inside loop, the manoeuvre has to be formed in front of the pilot. And again, the, the guidance says, Perfect manoeuvre is not required, but exit height and line need to be close to those at entry. And again, the examiner will be watching for whether the model skews out at all, particularly troublesome usually during the last half, the, the, the last quarter of the manoeuvre, and also watching for appropriate use of the throttle. Okay, next manoeuvre, 
two consecutive rolls into wind. So these start and finish at standard height and line that we described right at the beginning. Uh, importantly, the rolls must be continuous. So we don't want to see any hesitation between the first and second roll or even partway through the rolls. And the most important point in positioning is you should be halfway through the maneuver when the model passes in front of the pilot. Uh, and the, the thing here is that if you watch people fly, they generally find it easier to perform any aerobatic maneuvers once they've flown past themselves. Uh, and of course, what is required in this part of the test is the first roll has to be initiated before the model draws level with the pilot. So the, the, the first roll should be, be completed at approximately the point when the model passes in front of the pilot. And again, no serious loss of height or direction, although slight barreling in the roll is permissible. Um, you're not allowed to do the rolls, twinkle rolls. The rolls have to be slow enough so that the uh, examiner can notice use of the elevator during the maneuver. Use, you don't have to demonstrate use of the rudder, um, although you won't be penalized if you do, but the examiner will, will want the roll to be slow enough that you need to demonstrate some use of elevator. Okay, moving on. Uh, as someone's just asked a question of what a twinkle roll is, that's two rapid rolls um, that are done very quickly. In other words, so quickly that an examiner wouldn't be able to see that, um, uh, that any down elevator correction had been used during the maneuver. So two consecutive rolls downwind, and these maneuvers are in the opposite roll direction to those flown into wind. So all the previous comments apply. Um, and it's very important that the examiner makes sure that the rolls are in the opposite direction. Um, a little bit of a, a little bit of a giveaway. Um, whenever I'm doing a demonstration for a fixed wing B test, I always make sure I do my interwind and downwind rolls in the same direction at a workshop, just to see if the examiners are paying attention. Uh, <clears throat> uh, good question from Steve Reed actually about the direction okay. of the roll. Okay. Steve? Oh yeah, sorry. Um, does it matter when you're flying, um, uh, about to do your roll, can you roll into, into yourself or do you have to roll away from yourself as you're sort of rolling down the, down the strip? This is, this is a good question because Andy, Andy always likes, I know Andy, because <laughs> we, we've examined together, Andy always likes the, the initial part of the roll to be away from yourself. But actually in the guidance, it isn't specified because it's, I mean, and I, I understand where Andy comes from because the first part of the role takes you away from the flight line, but the yeah. problem is the second part of the role inevitably brings you towards it. So it's a bit of, you know, swings and roundabouts, but the, the, the bottom line is in the guidance, it's not specified, so you can do it either way. There is okay. quite a, um, a useful way because I've seen a number of people do B tests and they forgot which way they rolled for the first two rolls yep. uh, and then they come back for the second two and then either roll in the same direction or in one famous case he did one roll in one direction then thought oh that's wrong and did it in the other direction <laughs> very good yeah, yeah well, which, which was impressive <laughs> um and, and quite scary to be honest because they weren't very good yeah. um, <laughs> but uh, what i um if i'm instructing people up to the up to taking a beta so i suggest to them that if you're coming from the right hand side roll to the right if you're coming from the left, roll to the left. You'll always start rolling away from you. Um, but uh, just put your aileron stick, point it to where the aircraft's coming from, and then you just can't forget then. It becomes second nature. Yeah, I think that's a good good tip, Andy. So you automatically do the two two manoeuvres in opposite directions. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. And they're always away from the crowd. Yeah. We have uh, another question from John Collister. Hi. Last year, someone was taking their B and I saw him a week afterwards and he was told he had failed because he didn't use the rudder in the rolls. The, um, it's not in the guidance. Yeah. I, I said that. Not, not required yeah. in the guidance. Yeah. I know that. Examiner, well, some examiners maybe don't. Well, this is, this is another good thing. I mean, okay. It's tricky for the candidate to raise it with the examiner, but the candidate, just... would, the candidate would have been perfectly justified just turning around and saying, Actually, it doesn't say it's that in the guidance. Yeah. No. Yeah. 
Perhaps that was lack of preparation on his part. Well, it, it, it's yeah, it always pays to read the guidance. I know, mm. you know, it's a it can be a bit of a tedious and bit of a dry document, but yeah, it's um, it's uh, th those guidance documents are are really because they've been in existence for quite some time, and the the uh, tests have remained reasonably consistent for a long period of time. It's a, a highly developed document, so it, it's it always um. I, I was always a, almost a little bit sad in a way when I say to people, "Oh, have you have you read the have you read the the guidance?" And they are, they all say, "Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah." And then on a little bit further questioning, you find out actually what they've read is the handbook, yeah. which isn't the guidance. Uh, and I think, oh, all that hard work we've put into the guidance, and, and people aren't aware of it. So that's one of the things that we've tried to do is raise awareness of all these documents. Yeah. Anyway, I'm, I'm uh, rambling now. Moving on. Right. Oh, sorry, John, got another John, question. John's got his hand up again. No. Oh. John Beck. Yeah, yep. yeah ju just a quick one. So when, as with the other manoeuvres, when you're doing the role, should the candidate be talking to the examiner and saying which way he's rolling? He can do, but it's not a requirement. Okay. Right. So he wouldn't, wouldn't be penalised for doing it. And in fact, it's that's quite a good aid memoir. So yeah, no one. Yeah. Why not? Okay. Okay. Great. Cool. Uh, store turn. Okay. Can be either left or right. Um and uh, that's and, and and by that I really mean into wind or, or downwind, uh, and that's nominated by the candidate in advance of of the test. Um, starts at standard height and line, as it says. It's not positioned in front of the pilot. Interestingly, the guidance says approximately a hundred meters beyond, and I, I actually think a hundred meters is quite a long way off. But that's what the guidance says. Uh, most important point here uh, is the model must. The stall turn must be made away from the flight line. So if the manoeuvre is conducted off to the right hand side, the model will turn to the left. And if it's conducted on the left hand side, the model will turn to the right. Uh, and the recovery um, should be on a standard height and line. The normal, um, one of the normal errors is for people to recover too early. In other words, to recover uh, at a height significantly above that at which they started. I think, okay. I think the other sort of area you tend to see is uh, they pull up but don't pull up to the vertical. Correct, uh, yeah. See that, and um, it becomes more of a wing over if they're not careful rather than an actual stall yep. turn. Yeah. Yep. And interestingly, the guidance has, has this wording, the... the, the uh, the penultimate bullet point on the screen here, it has to be a recognisable stall term, but it's not expected to be perfect. Okay, moving on. Three turn spin. Oh, this is a good one. Okay. Yep. Must be conducted in front of the pilot, but slightly further out. Um, started into winds at an appropriate height, which will probably be, which almost certainly be higher. <laughs> oh, bless you, whoever that was. That, that, that Thank you. That's John who's not <laughs> muted himself. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, before he spreads COVID-19 to all yeah. of us. <laughs> okay, uh, so into wind at an appropriate height, which will be above the standard um, height and line that we talked about initially. Uh, importantly, the model has to be decelerated smoothly into the manoeuvre. In other words, it should drop into the spin because um, the, the guidance doesn't allow a flick entry. So the model must can't suddenly snap up and then drop down into the spin. It has to drop down into the spin without without going up. Um, it's important that it's a proper spin and not a spiral dive. And again, if the candidate's doing the, oh, my model won't do a proper spin, well, then we have to be asking, is it an appropriate model for the test? Uh, interesting, you, the guidance allows for aileron um, in the manoeuvre once the model is falling. And the recovery has to be on a heading and entry um, that's um, consistent with the with the the, the, the line of the uh, entry. Yep. Sorry, Joe. Uh, somebody's got a question. Yeah, Joseph. Hi, Joseph. Um, yeah, I was just wondering: is it a smooth deceleration, just to show that the candidate has, you know, control over the model rather than flicking it? in and kind of not having control as such yeah it's um you you you're, you're slowing up the aircraft um and letting it fall into the spin rather than you know using the aileron to make it spin 
or to start the yeah. spin. One of the things I look for is if a wing lifts at the start, they've used aileron to initiate into it. So that that's one of the key signs for me. Um, so yeah, it should slow down, try and keep uh, keep the aircraft level, and then as it starts to drop, as it falls, that's if you're going to use aileron, which isn't always necessary. Uh, at that point, it should come in rather than at the very start, so a wing lifts. And then okay. to answer the question of the difference between a spin and a spiral dive, in a spiral dive, the uh, the wing isn't stalled. That's the critical part. In a spin, one of the wings has to be stalled. The 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 wing that's in in innermost in the spin, in the direction of spin is the is stalled. Yep. Okay. Uh, I think we've another one. Uh, okay. John, John John Collister again. Some of these really light wing loaded planes i've got a sebar and it's almost bloody impossible to make it stall it just sits there and just the C flows. cg's cg's wrong it's right where they tell me to put it, it it's wrong is, is it an angel uh, no it's not it's a Qatar. Uh, uh, okay uh, no sukhoi sukhoi yeah almost uh, mr sukhoi mr sebar likes his cg's well forward if you move the cg back a bit you'll find it spins beautifully it spins all right it just won't stall oh <laughs> well, it has to, you have to install the stall well, to get it into I, a spin. I can make it do it by using the elevator and bring it in. In the end, in the end, it'll just flop. But just to get it to gently stop and come down, it, it yeah. won't do it. It just it's like a, a piece of cardboard floating down. I have to have the, in my Angel Fifty Evo. I have to have the battery as far back as it will go against the the rear former in the battery compartment, and I've still got several ounces of lead on the tail. To, and it, it spins. Spins beautifully now, but it didn't before. I'll have a look at that. Okay, and there's a at the very bottom of the slide here a slight deviation uh, away from the uh, exit uh, for the uh, for the heading on exit uh, is permissible. What I always tell my little tip to candidates is when the model's recovering in the vertical, that's when you can correct for any slight off heading um, before you actually pull the model to level on the exit heading. So. Okay, next maneuver. Uh, rectangular approach and go around. Okay, important thing here is this is an aborted landing and not a low pass. So the candidate has to convince the examiner that they really were going to land or could have landed off the, the approach. Uh, again, um, good communication, calling landing, looking that the candidate is visibly, visibly checking the active area um, before they commence. Um, it, this is a rectangular circuit is required uh, and model should approach with appropriate use of the throttle. So as again, not a low pass at high throttle, it's, it's a genuine landing approach. Um, the examiner uh, it will tell the candidate when to conduct the go round. Um, the examiner is obliged to wait until the model is approximately below 10 feet. But the examiner should also choose the moment so that he doesn't force the candidate into a touch and go. Um, the pilot should call going round or overshoot or something. And to be honest, don't really care what the candidate says, so long as they communicate to uh, what's happening to their to their fellow flyers. And the model must be climbed uh, safely back to normal circuit house. It's a pity um, Brian Cooper doesn't have audio with us tonight. And I'll, I'll raise the point that Brian, um, the discussion, Brian is also a, a, another area chief examiner. Uh, and also on the ASRC. The, the discussion we always have about this is, is this a measure of airmanship in terms of managing the aircraft in a, and taking it from slow speed flight in a relatively close to the stall condition back to normal cruise speed? Or is this actually a collision avoidance maneuver? Um, someone has run out onto the runway and you've actually got to pull the model away and abort your landing uh, to avoid a collision. Um, and Brian thinks it should be should be the the latter. Um, but actually, the way I think it's it's written in the guidance is is more of the former. Um, and the, you might think the latter is a good thing, and I and I do think it's a good thing. But we we tend to shy away from um, generating potentially model wrecking situations in tests. So it's a it's a worthwhile conversation to have with the candidate before they do it, um, because there's a little bit more to the manoeuvre than perhaps meets the eye, if if that all makes sense. 
microphone work. Was that you, Brian? It was, yes. Does oh. microphone work? Sorry, did I did I get all that right? Oh, you got it absolutely perfect. Lovely. Um, okay. In the in the guidance, I, I believe it says that it's a bolt to landing. Um, oh, actually, I'm can, let me have a look. Got in the way. This little Johnny chasing his football. You you don't want to be opening the throttle over his head. You need yeah. to be turning away from him. But yeah, as I say, I think the best way to to treat this. To, to these circumstances to have that conversation with the candidate beforehand so it could well be they could end up in the situation that that brian's describing but for the purpose of the test we're not actually to asking them to risk the model by doing that right here okay right okay rectangular circuit in the opposite direction to the the circuit we've just flown in the landing this is to show the examiner that you could have flown a landing circuit. You can, you're, basically, that you're not handed. You can fly a rectangular circuit in a left or a right-hand direction um, according to what the conditions uh, dictate. Uh, and and this, is a, this is a good point to raise Stuart's question or query again about site suitability because uh, I've been personally been to many sites where actually it would be very difficult to do this. And in fact, we held an examiner and instructor workshop at the site um, in, uh, uh, at Popham, where the, uh, the club there has uh, a model flying uh, runway within the circuit, uh, the, uh, the full size um, active airfield. But the problem is on the far boundary, they have relatively high trees and it's very difficult to fly a rectangular circuit within the confines of the field. Um, so it makes it very difficult to do a, a circuit at, at, at 40 feet. Um, but as again, all the other good things, visually checking that the airspace is clear uh, and announcing intentions that, to your fellow flyers that you're going to fly a circuit that's in conflict to the normal circuit direction. And the things to look for here is that the, the, the upwind and the downwind legs are par parallel and it is a genuine rectangular circuit and not a triangular circuit. And again, you're looking for good height control throughout the maneuver. Okay, I'm sure we've got some questions related to this. Can uh, I just ask a question on the last, um, this is Tony, on the last um, maneuver, the, the previous maneuver, are flaps allowed to be used during that? Uh, for the, for the go around? False <laughs> Yes, yes, of course. You can. Yeah, yeah, Thank not you. a problem. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Charles, Charles Aldous. Uh, yeah, it was just, um, I can't remember from the guidance, which I haven't got to hand, but can, during the test, can the examiner call out each manoeuvre, you know, in other words, what the next manoeuvre is going to be for the candidate? Uh, or, is he, or is he expected to remember them all? In the no, he, he, he doesn't have to remember them all. And most examiners I know will say something along the lines of, okay, okay, Bert, your next manoeuvre is. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Again, yeah, it's, it's it's something to discuss in the pre-flight briefing. Sure. Yep. Yep. Fine. Thank you. Uh, a question from Colin Martin. You'll need to unmute yourself, Colin. Okay, there we are. Can you hear me all right? Yes, yep. got you, Colin. Yeah, I think this is probably more about instructing than examining because I don't think this problem will arise quite so much uh, for somebody who's ready for the test. But I've found a number of candidates going into this circuit in the opposite direction have some difficulty in knowing when the opposite circuit actually begins, which is, of course, right in front of the pilot, but by flying downwind. Yeah. And having come out of a circuit in the normal direction and doing the bolt landing and overshoot, they very often seem to just go round and come back diagonally across the strip and start in the far far near side corner and th therefore only do three quarters of the of the circuit rather than flying out of the boat landing and into a procedure turn and then coming back downwind into the right place yes i, I think this is um this is very important and this is something an examiner will look for and it, I, I mentioned it right at the very beginning um the how the candidate positions for each of the manoeuvre is almost as important as the manoeuvre itself. 
Um, and this particular maneuver starts and finishes downwind in front of the pilot over the takeoff and landing area. And I, and I think that's important for candidates to appreciate that. But it's how the candidate positions for the maneuver is very important. And if they, if they rush into positioning, and the classic one actually, things like the loop, if the candidate has, has rushed their positioning for the loop, and they start the loop offline or, or, or with the model very slightly banked, uh, the loop will go wrong very quickly because it, the, the model will just screw out of it. So, uh, yeah, it goes back to what I was saying at the beginning, I think. In essence, it's positioning for each of the manoeuvres is almost as important as the manoeuvre itself. Okay. Thank you. I see. Moving on. Rectangular approach and land. Uh, okay, so it's exactly the same as we did for the um, for the overshoot, but in this in particular instance, the model has to land and the wheels have to touch within a pre-designated or a pre-agreed 30 meter boundary, and that will have been agreed with the candidate and examiner um, before the test. Again, you're expecting good visual checks uh, in the circuit and calling land in. Uh, we're expecting a, a proper rectangular circuit. So we have a, a crosswind, a downwind, a base and a final leg. Um, looking for appropriate use of the, uh, the throttle. Um, interestingly, what the guidance talks about is if for any reason the candidate aborts, and they can, but they have to have good reason for doing so. Okay, so common mistakes on the rectangular circuit. Well, <coughs> I just do the dreaded annotate and draw on again. Um, if, we, if we assume we're starting the circuit here, um, so if I just try and parallel the course it's drawn. So this part generally goes pretty well so until we get to here. And then what tends to happen is this. If anything's going to go wrong with a rectangular circuit, it ends up turning into a triangle and we don't have um, we don't get a proper base leg basically we don't get this bit ends up missing what I always tell my candidates to do is when they're here in this part look for the bottom side of the uh, the underside of the far wing if you can see that every now and then momentarily while they're on the downwind leg, they will almost that will all certainly help them avoid crabbing in like I've drawn here with the uh, with the purple line. I don't know if any of my other fellow examiners want to chip in if they they have any other seen any other common mistakes on the rectangular circuit. I think that's the main mistake I see. Um, they just don't leave enough room for the uh, base leg. Yeah. And again, it's one of those maneuvers. It doesn't matter whether you fly it tight. It doesn't matter whether you whether you, whether you fly it quite large. Um, but just just leave yourself space and time. I think that I, I think perhaps the only other thing that that, that candidates might do is um, is is turn too soon here and not leave themselves a, a whole lot of space. But but the, it's the purple line is the common one. It goes okay. back to. What I Andy was saying before about the figures of eight, you've got to allow enough room. The more room you have, the more chance you have to correct any errors sure. that you make. Yeah, absolutely. A question from Felix. Uh, yeah, what I've noticed is that sometimes the candidate will not actually do 90 degree turns and the, the rectangle goes out of shape. Um, right. if, you, if you can understand what I mean, so it's, it's not actually a rectangle, it's, um, there is a name for it, I'm not sure what the, uh, the, the name for it is, but it, it, it's not 90 degree angles, it's 60, 30, whatever, and it's not rectangular. It's a trapezium. And, thank you. <laughs> yeah. uh, I find it difficult to get them to understand that it has to be 90 degrees. Right, okay. What I always say when I'm when I'm tutoring people is I always expect them to, to bank the model and then stop the bank, bring it back to bring it back to straight and level. Interesting here in the diagram, you'll see that the model's been in the uh, in the crosswind and the base leg. You've seen the model's been in the diagram has been angled very slightly into wind, um, and that degree of of angle will depend on the wind strength. Uh, okay, question. 
So they're coming into land, quite a windy day, aerobatic plane, into wind, and it's not going to come down until a bit further along. So it's not going to be 30 meters, it's going to be a little bit further. What then? Is it, it's more important to land the plane safely than it is to try and force it down within 30 meters. Do you fail them or pass them? Uh, yeah. It's entire, it's examiner discretion. Uh, depends on the wind conditions, but that would suggest to me that they're not familiar with the model, or and or haven't practiced enough, yeah. because you you would have you would have agreed the can with the candidate beforehand, um, the exact, the you know the position the, or the the areas within the land and take off area that you're looking for. Yeah. So well, I mean, one yeah. of the clubs I fly at, your plane might suddenly go up or down six feet, suddenly. So you know. You, you well, make I, I, I suppose I mean, it's important you have that, that anyway, don't you? There's always the possibility that something like that can happen. But generally, assuming we haven't got one of these random wind effects, shall we say, um, if your candidate can't get down in the designated 30 metre spot, he's got his approach wrong. Um, you know, so but uh, you know, if you, if you get to a point where the, they're approaching the touchdown point, it's all going well, and then there's a a gust of wind that throws things off. It wouldn't, for me as an examiner, I'd be quite happy for them to to abort and go around and do it again. Uh, so yeah, that's okay to do if you're not gonna if it's something random, not just like it's a poor approach. Yeah, suddenly it, it gets flicked up in the air, which I've 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 had it both ways down as well. Yeah, then you go around and do it again. Yeah, if if, it, if it's it. yeah, if it's uh, justifiable. Yeah, if they've right. just got it wrong and they're missing the thirty meter designated area, um, that that's uh, clearly you know piloting an issue. But if if it's a random thing that's out of control, which occasionally happens, uh, you know, safe abort and go around, and another attempt would be yeah. for me would be perfectly acceptable. Yeah, it's like um, it's like an examiner. It's like any other manoeuvre. The examiner could ask for it to be repeated. I mean, that the, the, the candidate put the model down safely in a controlled manner is a good sign, uh, and that would be a reason for asking for it to be repeated rather than rather than failing them. Say, for example, right. yeah. yeah, yeah, it's it's a difficult one because weather conditions, especially in the UK, one of my sites is eight hundred foot above sea level, above uh, on a spur of the of the North Downs, and it's always windy there. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think it's important to say if something like that, hap that happens and then the candidate forces it down to get it down within the 30 metres, you you'd have to be questioning his judgment to do that. Um, you know, it'd be an unsafe thing to do and, and that's more likely to lead to a fail than, uh, than dealing with it correctly. Mission of 30. Yeah. 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 And we have a question from Jeff. Yeah, can we just clarify, do we have to touch down and come to a halt within the 30 metres? No, just touch no, it's down. just, just touch down. Touch down. Just touch down. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the exact wording in the in the guidance is wheels to touch within a predestinated... First, second or third bounce. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. And I think, moving on, we're nearly there now. Yeah. Okay. So then we have to safely remove the model and equipment from the takeoff landing area and complete the post-flight checks as required by the BMFA safety code following the RX off, TX off, clear frequency system or, or whatever is appropriate for your particular radio gear. Uh, and uh, that if it is different from the, from the normal RX off, TX off, um, you need to discuss and explain that with the examiner. Interesting question here that we've asked on all the other presentations as well is, Will you be taking your transmitter with you if you walk out onto the landing area to recover the model? So that's a question for all the all the participants here tonight. Well, I was always taught to leave the transmitter and then on the field, call on the field and walk out, make sure everything's clear, obviously. But I noticed that uh, on your uh, demonstration on YouTube, that you suggest taking the 2.4 transmitters with you which is against everything i've been doing for the last 40 years <laughs> well for in the in the past um that was a good discipline uh yeah. for 35 megahertz equipment it was absolutely essential yeah. to avoid the possibility of adjacent channel interference 
um, but that doesn't apply to 2.4. So there's, there's actually no technical reason for not taking a 2.4 gigahertz transmitter with you. Uh, and there may be good operational reasons, particularly in terms of safety for electrical powered models. Yeah. In yeah. terms of, you know, you're familiar with what your box does, whether you've got a safety cutoff switch, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and putting it down on the ground, it could fall over and inadvertently activate a control or giving it to someone who's not familiar with it. So it makes a lot of sense for 2.4 to take it with you. And in fact, if you read all of the guidance documents for all of the tests, they now say that generally for 2.4 gigahertz operation with suitable considerations, there's no reason why you shouldn't take it. But okay. that's not the case for, for 35 meg. Um, the other complicating factor is your club may have a club rule that says all operating transmitters must be in a given area. Um, and so that's a, an, an overriding consideration if your club has that rule. Mm. Um, which, um, which, which obviously you, you need to comply with because that's your, that's your local site. I mean, and then there's good reason for wanting all operating transmitters in the same area because it saves, saves somebody you know, unthinkingly switching on in the car park and you know, perhaps causing damage or doing something daft there. But, but in terms of the technical side of technical issue, with, with, there is no problem with 2.4. Okay, does that does that answer everybody's questions on that? And, or is there anything anybody else wants to chip in? So. Uh, Colin, there's he's sorry. Having... Yeah, no, this, this this has been actually I'm, I'm, I found it very interesting when I watched the YouTube video that actually you had this way to take it because literally two weeks before that I had a a, a, a conversation with um with our um what do you call it club chairman exactly about that rule. Because I think, you know, and that's why I wanted to ask, you know, if the BMFA has any, any official um, standings on this, because, you know, for me, I, I, exactly for the reasons what you just said, I don't like, especially with electrics, to put my transmitter down and walk away from it. It, it makes it, I mean, it makes, you know, I'm walking towards a model that I don't have control over. That's what, that's how I feel about it. So, yep. so, so the question I want to ask, because I'll, our club do have a rule, right? At this stage, in our rule books, that says you need to put your remote, your, your, your sorry, transmitter down, and then go and retrieve the model, which is why we had that discussion. And then basically, came in coming at the end of that discussion with, it, basically, what they said was nobody would, you know, would would um, give you or give you problems if you take your transmitter with you. But to me, that's you know, it's 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 a rule. Right, so as soon as you put a rule in a certain place... If, if it's in there as a rule, it should be abided by. Um, yeah, so until, or, or, until or, we need to re yeah. or, or we need, need to be removed, right? So yeah. basically... Sp speaking as a club support officer, having rules in that people don't either enforce or unwritten rules cause no end <laughs> of trouble, so get it dealt with. <laughs> okay, no, yeah. that's, that's I, why I just wanted to mention that. I mean, that ex yeah. exactly, I was so... So, in a way, I was glad when I saw... The, the, the beat test video or yeah. um, YouTube video because it it literally showed what exactly how I felt about you know leaving a transmitter in and, and walking away from it. It's yeah. the I should should point out that all the what's written in the achievement scheme guidance is consistent with the BMFA members handbook. So uh, so the, the members handbook says pretty much the same thing about two point four. Yep. But but this is not mentioned in the BMFA books, is it? That specific point. Of leaving a transmitter. It, the what what we say in the achievement scheme guidance mirrors and is in agreement with what's in the BMFA members handbook. Okay, <laughs> but there's yeah. no. But you you don't know of any any rule like that in BMFA. Uh, so. well, we don't have rules we have guidance but the problem yeah. is that i think what you've identified and this is common for many clubs throughout the country is it's the the, the club rules were built around good practice for 35 meg and they're just not they've yeah. just not kept the book up to date yeah they haven't moved on uh, yeah. where appropriate yeah. yeah okay so the best is to really raise that at the club level and yeah. say we need yeah. to remove this yeah 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 so. Uh, right, uh, we have a point from Charles, um, which we may have covered. Um, hi, yeah, just specifically, it's, it's obviously 
it's super important that the model should be not made live until you've carried it out to the taxi point. Um, some of us, and me especially on an electric model, I use an MKTEC safety switch, which has a, a red bung, which you pull out to make the model effectively live. So in other words, you can connect the, the battery to the ESC in the pits, but it doesn't, uh, sorry, connect the battery, which makes the avionics live, but doesn't connect to the ESC until this red bung on the side of the fuselage is pulled out, which you could pull out at the, which I pull out at the taxi point, as opposed to taking the canopy off and connecting up and all that carry on. Uh, is that permitted or um, not? Yeah. Yes, there's no, there's no problem with that. I mean, yeah. you can, you could carry the model out live. The, yeah. What the guidance says is if it's live, i.e. the engine's running or, or it's live, it's electric, it just yep. has to be restrained, suitably restrained. All the time it's live or the engine's running. Does that so how make sense? You, uh, well, how do you carry a model out when, how well, do you you're, restrain? You're, you're, holding if you, it, you're holding it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. restrained, yeah. yeah. Good okay. point. You know, you, it's not on the ground and you're not, you're yes. not taxiing it, you're carrying yes. it. Yes, yeah, I've got that. I mean, yeah. I, you, saw, you saw what happened in, hopefully you've seen the videos. Absolutely. I mean, and that's, that's, my, that's my practice. I... I, I I could carry the model live, but I don't need to. No. Um, so why would you? So I just Quite. make it live yeah. Yeah. at the point where where I'm about to to test which it before, I, which before I, I go flying. Yeah, which I can do with my safety switch, and yeah, I, and I wouldn't run, I wouldn't run any engine up without standing over the uh, the tail set. No, exactly. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Cool. I think all I think okay. it's also a, a good idea if you're using a system like MKTEC. Let the examiner know tell what exam. you're doing. Yeah, yeah tell the examiner. Yeah, I would yeah, do that. Yes. All yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. A question from Jeff. Yeah, I, I fly in Canada as well. And the, the question of whether you take the transmitter with you or not, it's, it, I think most clubs need to revisit their risk. Um, there's always a risk if you're carrying a model, particularly as the models today have got bigger and the transmitter and potentially it is all live. In Canada, what they do is to stop people walking out onto a live runway, they taxi back to a designated protected area. You take your transmitter with you. You can then make the model safe, make the transmitter safe, take the model back and take the transmitter back. So you're never carrying both at the same time. And that's a, they've, they've come to this by doing a, a proper risk assessment because they don't want people walking out carrying a model and a transmitter to or from a live runway. Okay. No, it's uh, it's uh, it's one one approach. Interesting. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Interesting approach. Yeah. yeah. Stuart. Uh, oh yeah, I'm uh, Just a quick question. Um, if you're running an IC, where you actually recover it from the strip, uh, majority of us have engine cuts on it. Which is there any recommendation on whether you should have cut the engine before you um, actually? Yeah, reach to the model, or, or what? I'm just thinking with electric. Once you power it off, it's it's kind of off. And a lot of people have, um, yeah, the the kill switches on the on the electric or the safe. If if you're going to pick up a, an IC that's sitting there ticking over, is there any guidance, or is it up to the individual club regulations as to recovery procedures? It would be uh, for me. It'd be up to the individual. Um, yeah, you may find that somebody can't. Uh, cut the engine from the transmitter so there's not there's nothing in the actual guidance about that um you you would do what is most appropriate for you for your site and your equipment yeah right. yes because the, yeah. the the test requirement is just to recover the model how you do that is is entirely at the candidate's discretion personally i always i would always try and taxi back or i always do taxi back whenever possible um because i think there's to taxi the model to the edge of the runway and make it safe there is far better than recover personally or with them or an assistant going out to the middle of an active runway to recover a model so i would always argue that to taxi back to a point a safe point like the yeah. like the gentleman was talking about the, in canada a safe point on the edge of the runway where you can either stop the motor or or disconnect or disable the the uh, the, the the battery in an electric system Right, I, think yeah. I, think, I think that's a lot better than walking out onto a runway. But, yeah, we, we, we've just put into all oh, my system in our pit and um, flight box anyway. So you, you always go out one way and always come back at the other end yep. of the strip because of COVID-19. But prior to that, 
uh, people used to taxi you back to uh, the pilot box and then recover in the pilot box sort of thing. But, well, so, hopefully okay. they weren't taxiing back to the actual pilot's box. To, well, well, they, they, to the they, side they, of it. There yeah. was a, a, a midpoint, uh, midpoint on the runway, depending on which end we were taking yeah. off from. But there was a recovery in the midpoint. But now, after COVID-19, you have to recover the model at the other end of the runway and then go back the one-way system. Yeah, so yeah. My my lead club has a has an in and out for the active runway. Yeah. Um, which is which is separated. And that, okay. And, it, and that, I go to a lot of JMA events and they have exactly the same thing. Buckminster has an in and out, doesn't it, Andy? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. anyway, okay. questions. Right. Okay. Questions. So we have um, f five of the mandatory questions. Uh, important point to make here about the mandatory questions: um, they weren't new, uh, and they, we always had these questions. It's just that they weren't mandatory. We we formalised some of the questions that examiners always used to ask by making them by making them mandatory. Uh, and for the BTES, it's a minimum of eight supplementary questions, which are based on uh, BMFA safety code and local club and, and local flying rules. So it's a minimum of eight. You might be asked more if the examiner has had to perhaps tease some answers out of you or you haven't been 100% confident about some of the answers you've given. You might, you might get asked more. OK, and I think that's about it. Oh, yeah, all these good things. We do it for fun, remember? Um, as I said uh, uh, during the presentation, we do spend a lot of time and effort producing the guidance booklets. Uh, and more recently, we've added uh, the videos to the portfolio of guidance. So uh, we're doing our best to help candidates prepare for the test. Uh, but also, you need to read the member's handbook <coughs> for all the good um, the safety practice and, and all the other things. It's very important. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from David. Okay, fire away, David. Yeah, I have a question about um, practice regime. Really, um, clearly, um, you want to practice each of the manoeuvres. Um, but then, is there any other advice you can give? Um, you know, about other things that are good to do, other practice uh, regimes that you know would it would help? Well, by the time you get to a B certificate certainly like to think all your good pit and and, uh, and startup and and uh, procedures away from the flight line are all highly developed um, but I think the, the probably the, the, the key thing that I would stress and it's things I've mentioned during the presentation other people have picked up on about is actually preparing the the to, to conduct all the maneuvers as a whole and how you're going to position from one maneuver to the next. In other words, are you going to put an extra circuit in? Are you going to do a procedure turn or whatever? It's just, um, yeah, you. it's perfectly understandable that you will be practicing the maneuvers in isolation, uh, probably in the early stages of preparing for the test. But then when you get pretty good at all the maneuvers, what you ought to do is then start stringing them together in the sequence that they are in the in the test because they they do have to be flown in that particular sequence uh, or that particular order they don't and interestingly they don't have to be it's not a, a an arresty turnaround aerobatic schedule you don't have to go bang 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 one maneuver after the other um, but they do have to be done in the right order so it doesn't matter if you take a couple of circuits to get positioned for your rectangular circuit in the downwind in the opposite direction to your landing circuit say for example um, and that's what I was saying, you know, always take your time. Um, but it's that knowing how you're going to position for the manoeuvre that's coming up next that will this show is... to the examiner that you've practised. And, and it, the performance will look so much more polished if you do that. Yep. Okay, that's this good. is Thanks exactly that. where the mock test comes in. Yep. Your okay. instructor and examiner can help enormously with mock tests you know, have you thought about doing it this way? How about putting a procedure turn in there, as Duncan said? Go through that process. You'll learn so much. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, a question from Joseph. Um, yeah, I thought when I read through the guidance and everything that it specifically said that as long as you agreed with your examiner before doing the test, that it didn't have to be in the order written. No, it does. 
<laughs> if you if you you check the 2020 guidance, uh, Joseph, I guarantee it doesn't say that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. I've got the uh, on another computer. I've got the document open in front of me. I will, I will, um, I'll find the relevant section while uh, you while while you're searching talking. for that. I'm just going to do a quick health check. Uh, Chris Anderson, are you okay? John's a bit concerned that you've been quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, our next yes, I'm one. fine. Okay, good. <laughs> Glad to hear. I was it. just, I was just, I was just interested with uh, Duncan when they were talking about uh, radio transmitism, whether to be on the field or off the field. One thing that I did get rather uh, startled by uh, when somebody found 35 meg was that he gave his transmitter to a long flyer, and then what happened is he walked onto the uh, flight path and. Uh, the, the guy fiddled with the uh, throttle and of course mode one and mode two the opposite way around and he didn't realise and when the plane uh, jumped up and started to take off on its own he, he, he managed to get it closed so it, 35 meg was a good idea to uh, keep it with you. On 35 meg the issue is if you go out there with an operating transmitter and somebody flies yes. over you there's uh, too, too much yeah. opportunity for uh, for interference so on 35 meg it's not a good idea to take it out well, although it, it, it's it, less of an issue now in as much as yes. it's, it's probably unlikely it'll be another 35 meg aircraft flying around yeah does that make sense yeah absolutely yeah yes. yeah okay I think one of them's covered. Yeah, I think one's covered in the next uh, slide, uh, which we shall go to. Uh, there we go. Uh, Jeff, <laughs> details out of the next uh, flying at Buckminster. Um, subject to government lockdown restrictions. Um, but our aim at the moment is to go ahead on the 8th of the 9th. Um, we will obviously, uh, if things change, um, currently camping is allowed from Monday, I believe it is. Um, so, but we're not entirely sure what facilities we'll, we'll be able to have open or anything yet. But we are, we are hoping to, to run a flying again on the 8th and 9th of August. Okay. And then questions. Um, uh, Peter Farnell had a question. Are you there, Peter? Trying to get it to work. Uh, there we go. It's just we're going for a fixed wing test. Presumably, the examiner is going to be cognizant of that, not start asking multi rotor FPV type questions. Or are we expected to know everything about everything? The, the guidance actually says you should be familiar with all, all of the questions, the mandatory questions, but it also says the examiner is expected to choose questions that are appropriate for the test being taken. Right, thank you. Bear in mind, none of the mandatory questions specifically relate to multi-rotors, by the way. The, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, it's not just the, the mandatory questions, it's... Yeah. Yeah. The, the supplementary questions should all be based on a relevant aircraft and your local flying site rules and public yeah. public display flying. Um, he's not going to ask technical, or he shouldn't be asking technical questions about helicopters and multi rotors of his <coughs> test. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And we have Corn question. Sorry, I'm asking so many things tonight. Um, all right. Just just on the last point is. Um, well, one thing I find a bit challenging is some of the maneuvers. Um, can the examiners um, to who to ask when you when you're trying to teach? Well, if you can't get a maneuver right, so you need to start asking around in the club. And the best pe people to ask is the examiners, right? But if you want that examiner to do the test, then there's obviously a how can I say? Is there a a, Conf a conflict, conflict of interest. A conflict of interest. Thank you very much. That's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> in in the ideal world, um, if your instructor wouldn't take you for the test, um, but we don't live in an ideal world. 
um, if you've got somebody else available to, to another examiner available, it's much better for them to be taking the test. Um, but if you've only got one examiner in your club and he happens to also be instructing, um, you know, it's a needs must case, I think. Mm. Yeah, because I think for me, the big, one of the biggest challenges is, you know, you can either try it on your own and do it wrong or get someone to really help you to get it right, um, you know, from day one. Because, yeah, that's for me, I think that's one of the biggest challenges. You know, it's, it's in, in fixing a certificate or the, you know, there's a lot of people that can teach you how to fly, right? But when it gets to these B stuff, to do a proper spin, to do your proper things, you know, you need to get people that really have flown quite a while. You know, um, and that I think I find is a challenge actually at clubs. I think if, I don't know how to address it, but, you know, it's not, to find someone that's really knowledgeable and really willing to go into that sort of details with someone is, you know, in the same manner that you would do your A test, you know, practicing and, and teaching. Yeah. I think yeah. it's very lacking in, in clubs today. Um. In some clubs, yeah, some clubs don't have any examiners at all. Um, but that's just a matter of, in some respect, a little bit of effort from the club to, to you know, to rectify that situation. Of course, the the ASRC, Duncan, uh, your local area coordinator, and myself will do everything we can to, to help clubs. Uh, but there needs to be a certain willingness from clubs to deal with that situation. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I think the the the, the important point is that. Andy said right at the beginning, yeah, in an ideal world, the, uh, your instructor and examiner would not be one and the same. But, but realising that we live in the real world, and as Andy said, you might only have one examiner in the club and he may also be an instructor. Um, the, it's, not, it's not prohibited uh, under the scheme rules. Uh, with a, a very good, uh, an interesting uh, point from John Bridget, who uh, is struggling with bandwidth. So I'll, I will read this out. Okay. Uh, John says, going back to the circuit at 40 foot, the ANO states that minimum distance from uninvolved, uninvolved people f with from an SUA is 50 meters. At 40 foot, there is a danger of infringing this rule if, for example, there are footpaths, roads or fields with farm workers in near the flying site. He goes on to say, if when we get the new regulations from EASA, this becomes 150 metres. Um, i take a couple of points there. Um, the ANO states 50 metres, but only if you're carrying a camera or surveillance aircraft. Currently, for... A small unmanned aircraft, it doesn't define a minimum distance. Um, it, it only defines that if it's a small unmanned surveillance aircraft. Uh, the, but you do make a, an interesting point. At 40 foot, you've got to consider if there is uninvolved people there, you, you shouldn't be overflying them at 40 feet. Uh, you would wait till they've gone. Um, you'd have to do that. Yeah. Um, and the point on the ARSA... Um, Again, that's not quite right because we aren't going to be operating under any of the specified categories in the guidance and the documents EASA have put out. We will be operating, this is almost certainly, under a specific permission for, for members of uh, UK national associations, which is being negotiated with the CAA. Um, the, there was uh, a meeting with them last week they're actually hoping to to get that permission in place before the uh, the rest of the EASA stuff comes in. Um, it's likely, most likely, to be a case of we will be operating as we do now, and they will bring in the the current exemptions that are in place will be built into the permission. So those are. Um, so we'll no longer have the exemptions, but because all the aspects of those that are built into the permission. So as it stands, the, uh, the 150 metres is almost certainly not going to be applying to us. But until these things are actually in, um, you can't say for definite, but uh, we should be operating under a, a specific permission for members of UK model flying associations. Um, going forward but as I say until we actually see and we've got that in black and white um, you know you don't quite know but that is 
very much what has been indicated by the CAA going forward for us. Okay. Are you okay with that, John? I know he can't speak, so he'll have to type it in the chat box. Um, in the meantime, uh, Nick's got his hand up. Hello, guys. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm insisting that everyone in my club uh, puts the operator ID on their aeroplane. Is there any change uh, when the legislation, you may have covered that a little bit there when you were talking, Andy, I didn't catch most of it, but is there any, is there going to be any change to that or is when the revisions come in, will the operator ID change? So they have to change all their stickers on their planes. <laughs> yeah. The... Yes. It's the yes. The the operator ID, the requirement to register with the CAA as an operator of a small unmanned aircraft is in now. It is it is current legislation, as is the requirement to be competent, um, i.e. have a flyer ID or hold one of our achievement schemes. That in, that's not going to change. At the next renewal of your operator ID, it will almost certainly be different. Um, or the, this, certainly the aim is for it to be different and it, it's, it's probably going to be a bit longer um, and because they're going to be harmonised across uh, all the EASA countries um, so but having said that obviously the, uh, the changes were supposed to come in, in, uh, in um, now, tomorrow in fact mm -hmm initially and then, and then they were put off to November and now they've been put off to, to early January but I would imagine by the time certainly for anybody who has uh, acquired the operator ID through the BMFA the first of those I think expire on the 21st of February so by then I would suspect we're on the new operator IDs almost certainly um, talking of, I, I know you're probably all aware that the uh, current exemptions have all run out today or run out today in terms of competency and being able to register through uh, the BMFA. The, the competency, competency ones were reissued um, a couple of days ago. They now expire at the end of the year um, and we are... Um, just waiting for the CEA to reissue the exemption in terms of registering through the BMFA, but that's basically just waiting for a signature on the bottom of it. So that's probably going to be tomorrow. Sorry, Andy, just confirm what runs out today. The the exemptions <laughs> for registering uh, with the CEA through the UK Association, so being able to register through the BMFA. Uh, and also the exemption from needing the flyer ID um, because you've got an achievement scheme certificate uh, ran out today or the run out at midnight tonight. The, the, the competency ones have been reissued, uh, so they run till the new uh, permission comes in whenever that is, uh, or certainly at the moment it's dated the end of the year. Um, and uh, they are reissuing the exemption that allows people to register through the BMFA, oh, uh, which should be in tomorrow. So basically, it's as we were, yeah. uh, to all intents and purposes. It's just they've left it very, very late to actually issue these things. Just because a lot of people in my club are asking me what is the situation, I'm like, well, I knew there was the deadline today. I knew I knew about that, but then of course, um, there's there's been quite a lot of wind about that it's all going to change again uh, next year in terms of the, the operator ID. So it's all, everyone's a bit Almost like... Almost certainly the operator ID is going to change next well, year. But you... after, from that point on, it should be a fixed one that you stays with you for as long as. Okay. And that potentially, that, that change date will be early part of next year? Potentially, yeah. Um, that's what they're aiming for, but... Okay. As I say, with, with the current situation uh, with COVID-19 and that, there's a lot of things keep getting pushed back and, uh, you know, we're, but I, I would expect it to be changed by the time, certainly anybody who's applied for the operator ID through the BMFA, I would expect by the time that comes for renewal, which the earliest of those is the 21st of February next year, mm -hmm. I'd expect the operator IDs to change. Right. Just to just to find a quick question: Is any one of the uh, the group here tonight? Has anybody been investigated, or has anybody had any council executives or police ask about or 
club and inquire about uh, looking at people's uh, operator ID? Any sort of uh, any examples of that? No. No. How, how, how are they going to monitor this and police it potentially? I don't think the <laughs> I don't think the intention is to police it as such. It's there to use in the event that somebody is caught flying unlawfully. Right. Well, they um, so, the yes, certainly in my view, the the main thing the registration and the operator I do uh, side of things gives. Um, or does is give the police and the authorities something that's very very easy to prosecute somebody for you right you know the proof is there you're either registered or you're not uh, i think previously there's quite a few people that perhaps we would have all liked to have seen prosecuted weren't because it was quite difficult to uh, um you know to to produce uh, proof beyond uh, reasonable doubt, but uh, you're either registered or you're not. And if you're not, it's something that's dealt with very easily. So that's the main thing it, it does. Obviously, uh, people haven't quite got um, the excuse that they don't know what the legislation is anymore. If, they, uh, if they've passed and they've got the flyer ID, they can't claim ignorance anymore as well. Hey, thank you, Andy. Yeah, no worries. A uh, question from Charles. Yeah, just on the, uh, while we're talking about the um, flower IDs and the CIA registration, um, is there any le legal requirement uh, by the clubs, club membership secretaries or secretaries to, to monitor, check or enforce that individuals are complying with the law? Or is it simply that the flyer is flying lawfully if he hasn't done it, but it doesn't reflect on the club if, it, if he has an issue? It certainly doesn't reflect on the club. I didn't it, think that was it's, a it's a matter of individual responsibility. Yep, that's what um, I thought. But one of the things we did, we have made sure that the insurance, the club insurance and all the extras that clubs benefit from is in place in the event of a claim made against the club yeah. due to the activities of an individual member flying while not being registered. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Fine, thank you. Right. Um, right, I think, uh, yeah, as I mentioned about the flying at Buckminster, the, um, we will be going ahead subject to government uh, instruction and advice, but, you know, fingers crossed that will be going ahead. Um, and then we're on to the uh, question side of things, which uh, at this point I'm actually going to stop the recording. Um, so ju just to finish off with, I think uh, myself and Duncan, everybody else on the ASRC, will thank everybody for joining us. And... Um, I'll stop the recording if I can find it.